Most musicians have heard of phaser or flanger at some point in time. Many use this effect regularly, yet don't really understand what's actually going on when they hit the bypass button on their pedal. This is understandable due to the more abstract nature of the phaser effect. It's difficult to visualize what's happening to a signal as it passes through a phaser. Through this video, we'll try and unlock some of the mystery behind the phaser. Using some theory, a little bit of electronics knowledge, and some real-world examples, we'll take you through a phaser start to finish. For those who are new to the phaser, the phaser effect gives a guitar a swirling, kind of hollow, spacey sound that sweeps up and down through the frequency spectrum, adding life and richness to a guitar part. Here's a sample of a guitar playing through the phaser effect. To understand phasing, it's important to understand phase. If we look at a sine wave, where the wave crosses zero and starts rising is considered to be zero degrees. Following along the wave, its maximum point would be 90 degrees. A zero crossing going down would be 180 degrees. 270 is its maximum negative value, and then back up to 360, which is zero again. The time between zero and 360 degrees is the period of the wave, and is equal to one second divided by the frequency of the wave. If we take another sine wave of the same size and frequency and overlay it here, it would be considered to be in phase. If we move it later in time, it would be out of phase. The amount that it's out of phase is measured in degrees, and this is the phase shift. The distance between positive zero crossings can measure the degree of phase shift. So in this case, it's 90 degrees out of phase. At 180 degrees, the two sine waves would completely cancel each other out if they're added together. In real life, there's usually more than one frequency happening in a signal. A guitar signal, for instance, will have many frequencies happening all at the same time. What would happen in this instance? If we were to phase shift the signal equally over all frequencies, say by running it through a delay line, you would get a frequency response that looks like this. This is the frequency response of a signal that has been phase shifted one millisecond and added back to the original signal. Notice how there are many peaks and valleys and they get closer together as they increase in frequency. Here's why. The period of a one kilohertz wave is one millisecond. So a one millisecond phase shift is 360 degrees through the waveform, which is perfectly in phase. If you notice, there's a peak at 1K. This is also true for any multiple of 1K. So 2K, 3K, 4K, etc. are all in phase. A 500 hertz wave has a period of two milliseconds. This means that with a one millisecond phase shift, the wave is now 180 degrees to the original waveform. This is the point where a complete cancellation occurs. Notice the valley on the graph at 500 hertz. And just as the peaks repeat, a valley will occur at every multiple of the time shift plus one half. So at 1.5K, 2.5K, 3.5K, etc., will all be out of phase as well. In between the peaks and valleys, there's a continuous shift from reinforcing to canceling. This is why the graph has smooth curving lines. All of the peaks and valleys together are called a comb filter because of the way they look like a comb on the frequency graph. So if we stopped right here, we'd basically have a flanger. Most flangers will take the phase shift and modulate it up and down to give a sweeping effect to the comb filter. So what separates a phaser from a flanger? Well, a phaser has a small number of peaks and valleys, usually one, two, or three, in contrast to the flanger's many. The other difference would be that the valleys don't get closer together as they increase in frequency on a logarithmic frequency response graph, like the ones we've been looking at. So how can we use phase shift to get a specific number of peaks and valleys? Remember that phase shifting the entire signal would produce a peak and a valley at every multiple of the time shift. So this method wouldn't work on its own. We need a way to phase shift only certain parts of the signal. This is achieved using an all-pass filter. An all-pass filter will allow every frequency to be passed through at an equal volume. So the frequency response remains unchanged. But it can be used to change the phase response. Here's how. This is a simplified representation of an all-pass filter. But it's easier to understand what's happening with this diagram than a full all-pass filter circuit. An all-pass filter takes the input signal and splits it into two identical copies. It then inverts the phase of one of the signals. So at this point, the two signals are basically mirror images of each other. It then runs one signal through a low-pass filter and the other signal through a high-pass filter, then combines them together. The result is a flat frequency response 
but the phase response has changed. Here's what the phase response looks like after passing through an all-pass filter. Notice the phase response goes from 0 degrees through to 180 degrees as the frequency gets higher. The 0 degree part is basically the original signal, and the 180 degree part is the inverted signal, and everything in between is a blend of the two. Where there's an equal amount of both the original signal and the inverted signal, the phase response is at 90 degrees. This is called the corner frequency, and in this case it's about 1 kilohertz. To get a phaser, we can use a bunch of these all-pass filters in a row to shape the phase response how we like. Each all-pass filter is called a pole. Here's what the phase response looks like after two poles, three poles, and four poles. Now if you listen to this phase shifted signal on its own, chances are you wouldn't hear much difference from the original signal. This is because human ears aren't very sensitive to the phase of a sound entering the ear. To get the effect we're looking for, we have to blend the phase shifted signal that we've created back with the original signal. This creates the peaks and the valleys in the frequency response, which our ears are sensitive to. The four pole frequency response looks something like this. There are two valleys with peaks surrounding them. Why? If we look at a four pole phase response on the graph, notice how it moves through 180 degrees, then through 360, 540, and eventually approaching 720. Well, when you're looking at phase, it's kind of like a circle. Once you pass 360 degrees, you're starting over at zero. So we could relabel our graph to look like this. Now if we look at every point where the phase response is at 180 degrees, these are perfectly out of phase with the original signal, and will represent the center of one of these valleys. Conversely, everywhere it crosses zero degrees, there will be a peak. So a four-pole phaser has two valleys, and a two-pole phaser has one valley, because it only crosses 180 degrees once. Here's what a two-pole frequency response graph looks like. These are the most common configurations you'll see in a phaser. You can keep adding poles to get more dips. For each two poles, you'll get one dip. So what about three poles? Well, this is an interesting instance, because as the frequency gets very high, the phase response approaches 180 degrees which when added back to the original signal, will act like a low pass filter, making the guitar sound very dark. To avoid this, we can add a phase shift equally to every frequency before running the signal through the all pass filter. This essentially pushes everything up about 70 degrees, giving us a phase response like this. Now there are two 180 degree crossings, so the three pole frequency response graph looks more like a four pole graph, but the dips are spaced much further apart. We found this to be pretty nice sounding. We can adjust how deep the valleys are by adjusting how much of the phase shifted signal we blend back with the original signal. A mix of half and half will give us the deepest valleys. We're looking at the frequency response of a four pole phaser as we change the mix from 100% dry to a 50-50 blend, then back to the dry signal again. This new sound we have is definitely audible, but unfortunately it isn't very cool sounding. The real magic happens when we start to modulate the phase response, and this is pretty easy to do. Using a variable resistor, we can change the corner frequency over time and move the phase response accordingly, essentially moving the peaks and valleys up and down in frequency. Here's a four pole phaser's frequency response as it moves up and down. Another way we can manipulate the sound is with a resonance or feedback circuit. Our ears are very sensitive to buildups of energy around a frequency. It's kind of our way of recognizing the sound of an enclosed space. We can do this by adding energy to the peaks in between the valleys. A resonance circuit basically takes the output of a series of all-pass filters and adds it back into the beginning. This is pretty much like holding your guitar in front of your amp to get feedback. It's pretty easy for the whole circuit to go crazy, but if done correctly, the result is a very pronounced emphasis of the peaks in between the valleys, which in turn makes a very pronounced phaser sound. Here's a four pole phaser's frequency response in yellow. Overlaid in green is the frequency response with the resonance circuit engaged. Notice the significant boost to the peaks in between the valleys. Well, that pretty much sums up phaser 101. I'm Dan with Empress Effects. Thanks for watching.